Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Unizor Education. Uh, I would like to continue talking about electrostatic fields and we will consider today uh, the concept of potential. Potential electro of electrostatic uh, field. Uh, obviously it's related to work, to energy, um, and forces obviously which exist in the electric field. Sometimes I'm uh, changing from electrostatic to electric, which in this context is exactly synonymous. Now, this lecture is part of the course called Physics for Teen. Uh, it's presented on unizor.com. Also, every lecture is on YouTube, and uh, you probably can find it over there. But I do suggest you to uh, watch the lectures from the unizor.com website because it's a course, which means lectures are presented in certain logical sequence. Every lecture has uh, detailed notes. There are problems solved. There are exams, etc. So, and the site is completely free, by the way. There are no uh, ads, no financial strings attached. So, physics for teens, electric field potential, or electrostatic field potential. Okay, let me start from something which we have already learned. First of all, we have learned that there is a Coulomb's law which describes basically the force which exists when two charges, one of them at point A and another at point B, located at uh, the uh, distance R, um, then each charge uh, experiences the force from another charge. Well, it might be attracting force if um, charges are uh, similarly charged, like excess of electrons on both, or deficiency of electrons for both. The first one is called positive. Um, excess, no, excess of electrons is negative, and deficiency is positive. Um, now, if they are of different uh, types, for instance, one is positive, another is negative, uh, then it will be the attracting force. But the uh, um, magnitude of the force is basically defined by um, this particular expression. Now, if we will assign signs, positive or negative, to our charges, again, positive for deficiency of electrons and negative for excess of electrons, then the sign of this product would actually signify the direction of the force in one direction which is attracting or another direction which is um, uh, repelling and obviously it all depends on system of coordinate which one is to the right and which one is to the left but this is just irrelevant right now what's important is that the sign is changing if both are positive or both are negative it's always uh, repelling. If it's positive and negative, or negative and positive, that's attracting. Okay, so that's what we know. And it's about point objects. Right now we're talking about electrical, uh, electrically charged point objects. Now, the second component of the whole picture was the component, the concept actually, of, of the electric field around the electrically charged object. In case of a point object, it's a radial field, which means um, uh, th there is a force which exists on certain distance from the point object, which is the source of the of this field, and this force is um, acting on any other charged object which is brought into uh, into the field of the main object. Now the force. Again, it's uh, described as this one, and then we have introduced um, the concept of intensity of the field. You see, when we're talking about the field, we're talking about one single um, main source of this electric field. Now, this is, in the Coulomb's law, we have two, for, uh, two uh, charges present. In case of a field, we're talking about the field produced by one particular charge. And the way how it acts on another charge which is brought into this field depends obviously on the charge of the main source and the charge of the probe. So in this case, let's say it, at point A we have the main force 
the main source, so the charge of the um, uh, object uh, at point A is called main, and the point B would be a probe. Now, um, how can we characterize the field of a single main object uh, quantitatively? Well, if we will just take a probe object which has a specific charge, which is by definition is plus one coulomb, then we can actually measure the force which the main charge exerts on this probe charge as the main characteristic of the field. So if we know the intensity of the field, which is the force exerted on this particular probe charge at any point in space around the main object charged with QA uh, amount of electricity, this is the intensity of the field that completely defines the field itself as a characteristic of the, this particular object which, which is uh, charged with QA. So, irrelevantly of any other charge, the field and field intensity is the characteristic of one particular charge at one particular point in space at some distance from this main charge. That's done too. Okay, so what's next is, next is what if we would like to move some kind of a probe object, let's say B, from one place in the field which is produced by the charge, main charge, to another field. Now that's a very important um, thing because this basically is um, uh, related to energy because it's work, right, work related to energy. So we have to spend some energy to, to bring certain charges together or move it uh, um, far from each other, etc. So energy and work are related. So we are talking about right now about work, which is needed to move the object from one place to another. Well, let's go back to what is the, the, the work. Well, obviously the work is in a simple definition, the product of the force by the distance this force is acting. Well, obviously it's a good definition, but only for those forces which are um, going uh, along the, uh, the trajectory, and trajectory is a straight line, and the force is constant without any problems. Whenever we are talking about a little bit more complicated things, like curved uh, trajectory and changing force, this is not good, obviously. But what is good is we have to really talk about uh, infinitesimal increment of work which we have to spend if we would like to use the force F on an I I uh, infinitesimally small uh, uh, distance dS. And again, here is if um, the force is acting along the trajectory. What if it's not? Well, then we have to multiply it by cosine of the angle phi, where angle, angle phi, so let's say this is trajectory, so at this particular point, this is my ds, and this is a vector now, and what if the force acts, uh, for instance, at this particular direction? This is my force, again, as a vector. So there is an angle here. So the projection onto this direction would be the cosine of this angle, right? So that's why the cosine exists. And um, talking about vectors, now this is much more conveniently uh, expressed as a scalar product of two vectors. So if you remember from the vector algebra, if you multiply the magnitude of one vector by magnitude by, uh, of another vector and the cosine of angle between them, you will get something which is basically the uh, scalar product of two vectors. So this is the most kind of general um, definition of, of the work. So let's talk about the work which we can really perform moving object um, inside a spherical or radial uh, field produced, electric field produced by some charge. 
Okay, so that's what we're doing right now. Okay, so we have, let's use the capital Q instead of a QA as a main source of electricity. Now, um, so it actually, all the forces from this are directed in some direction, okay? Now, it doesn't really matter whether it's a positive or negative, whether uh, the arrow is this way or opposite when it's attraction or uh, repelling, it doesn't really matter. So let's assume that we have certain um, charge Q here, lowercase q, and this is the radius R between them. So we know the force. So the force is equal to K times Q times Q divided by R square. Okay, now, so this is the force. First of all, let's consider that we are moving our charge only along the radius where it is. So let's say we are moving from R1 to R2. From R1 radius to R2 radius relative to center of um, electrical charge. My question is, what's the work? Well, as you see, even if our trajectory is a straight line, our force is variable, because the force is decreasing. The force is decreasing as the radius is increasing, right? So we can't really just use F times S. We have to really use some kind of a um, differential uh, equations here or some kind of a calculus basically uh, which would involve integration. Now what is this? Well let's consider you have a point at radius x. So let's consider x plus dx. So this is my infinitesimal uh, distance. My force, we can assume that this in, since uh, dx is infinitesimal increment, so the force depends only on the x. It's not changing within this infinitesimal uh, interval. Now, the distance is between these main objects is k, so it's equal to q times q divided by x squared. Now, what do we do to calculate the work? We have to multiply f of x times dx, which is the distance covered. So f of x times dx, this would be my differential of work. And we have to integrate it to get the whole work. We have to integrate it from We have to integrate it from x equals to r r1 to x equals to r2, f of x dx. And this is the total work done by, uh, done to change the location from r1 to r2, which is equal to of k q q x square dx. Now this is a simple thing, obviously. Integral of 1 over x square is minus 1 over x because the derivative of 1 over x is minus 1 over x square, so times this minus would be this plus. So this is actually k q q divided by x with a minus sign in limits from R1 to R2, which is R2 will be with a minus and R1 will be with a plus. So it will be K Q Q times 1 over R1 minus 1 over R2. So this is my W R1 R2. Amount of work which is needed 
to move uh, my uh, charge Q lowercase Q in the field produced by upper uh, uppercase Q from distance R1 to distance R2 along the radius. So this is a radial movement. Great. Let me just write it down here. Okay, that's done. So this is only for radial movement. Now, let's talk about another type of movement. Now, we are in a radial field, right? So, what if we are moving the charge along the circle around? Or a sphere, if you wish, in a three-dimensional three space? without changing the distance. What happens if our probe charged with lowercase q is moving along this particular trajectory which is spherical um, around this particular uh, charge? Well, let's think about it. Force acts along the radius, right? So this is the force. Now, my trajectory is along the circle, which is this one, which is tangential to this particular circle. Now, tangent is perpendicular to the radius, always, which means that this force is always perpendicular. F is perpendicular to ds, to an infinitesimal increment of... Um, of the trajectory, which means their scalar product is equal to zero, which means we don't really have to spend any energy, there is no work which is involved moving um, a, a probe charge around the source of electricity. Because, again, the radius is always perpendicular to trajectory and there is no work. But same thing is if you are in the gravitation field of the Earth you are on the floor and you are moving horizontally something. The gravity is completely neutralized and uh, um, there is no work actually involved in this particular case, right? Because the force is perpendicular. Now, if you are in a satellite which is circulating the Earth uh, on some orbit, it just circulates by itself. There is no energy which is necessary to move it along this particular um, orbit. Well, as long as the, the speed is properly calculated, etc. So it's not standing still, obviously. So, again, to calculate the work uh, needed to move it from one place to another along a spherical or, or circular trajectory around the main source of electricity, requires no work. Now, what's important, so in this case we have the force times um, times differential of trajectory is equal to zero, so the work is equal to zero. Now, what's um, also important to, um, to keep in mind that, again, in every field, let's say it's a spherical field or radial field, whatever, any kind of a movement can be represented at any infinitesimal moment of time as movement along the circular orbit and movement radially to another point. Now, this is, well, let's consider it on the, on the surface, not on the spherical point. Here again, if I would like to move, let's say, from this to this. I can move this way and then this way. And this differential 
is obviously easily represented as two, rep uh, two, two differentials, spherical and radial. Now, what's important, therefore, is um, whenever we have any kind of a movement within this field, we really have to understand that any increment can always be implemented in spherical plus radial movement. Which means, considering that the spherical is always zero, right, because we just talked about this uh, force is perpendicular to trajectory, and the radial is according to this formula, we can always find out what exactly is the work which is needed to uh, move it from here to here. It depends actually only on the radiuses, this one and this one. This is R1, this is R2. And it's exactly the same as from here to here. Because you can always do it this way and then this way. Now, this is on a macro level. You can always do it on a micro level. So, for instance, from here to here, you can implement it this way. A little bit here and a little bit here. A little bit there, a little bit here. Again, radial and radial. Uh, spherical and, and, and radial. Or circular and radial. And that's how we will move. Now, what's important about this formula is, now, if this is from R1 to R2, and then if you have from R2 to R3, which is exactly similar to this, if you will add them together, what you will get? This will cancel out, and WR1, R3, which is equal to this plus this, would be equal to W. Uh, R1, R2 plus W, R2, R3. This is obvious from this, right? If you will add them together, uh, 1, 2 plus 2, 3, uh, R2 will cancel and you will get exactly the same way as you, would go, as you would go straight from R1 to R3. So that means that the field is additive. Um, well, the formula for the work actually is additive. And that, um, and that actually results in a very important quality of the field. No matter how you move from one point to another, what's important is what's your beginning point and what's your end point. Actually, the beginning distance to the center and ending distance to the center. No matter how uh, um, your trajectory is arranged. Because even if you go outside and then inside, it would be positive in one case, negative in another case, whatever it is, whether R1 is greater than R2 or R2 is smaller than R3 or whatever, whatever else, it will still be the same formula and the sum of all these movements would be exactly the same as movement from the beginning to the end. This is a very interesting characteristic of the electrostatic field. Um, the force within this field. Um, uh, it, 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 it's called stationary, um, uh, uh, stationary force. And that's what's very, very important. It's conservative. The whole uh, field is called conservative field because it conserves the energy. Because this particular equation about the work means that no matter how you move, if you will eventually come back to the initial point, you will have the difference zero, which means your work uh, will, will, be z z will be zero. No additional work is required. So this is a conservative um, uh, field w I in which any kind of a movement in this field, if there are no others, uh, other forces, other fields involved, conserves the energy. So whatever was before, after you move within this field back to the original point, would actually not change the amount of energy. The energy conservation is very important. 
So the force is called conservative and the field is called conservative. And now we can go to a concept of potential, because now it's very important. Because what this looks like, well, it looks like the characteristic called V of R equals to KQ divided by R is very important. You can call this characteristic a characteristic of the field and the potential of the field. So this is the definition of potential of the field. That's basically the amount of work which requires to bring your um, movement, your, your, your um, object um, from the place where there is no energy, let's say it's infinitely remote place, to the place which is at um, distance r. And the object obviously is plus one probe object as we usually use. The same thing as we have in, uh, defined the intensity of the field. We use this probe object of one coulomb, positive one coulomb, to define the um, uh, the potential of the electric field. So it's amount of work needed to bring from, let's say, from infinity or any other point where there is no field. Well, infinity in case of a radial field, obviously. From infinity to um, uh, to the uh, radius R. Now, if you will put it this way, then the correct thing is R1 is equal to infinity, R2 is equal to R, let's say, and if you will substitute it here, 1 over infinity, obviously we are talking about limits here, etc., will be 0. So the whole thing will be with a minus sign. So that's very important. In the definition of the potential, there is this minus sign. So let me just correct. I mean, it's still important without the sign, but the correct thing would be with a minus sign. So the minus k times the charge of the central main object divided by radius is called a potential of this electric field at the distance r from the center, which is obviously the same as any other on the same distance, on the same radius. Now, what actually follows from here is that if you move um, certain uh, object from one radius to another radius, what you really have to do is, if you know the potential of the field, you have to just sub subtract one potential from another, because that's what this is. If you're moving from um, R1 to R2, you have to subtract it from minus V of, you have to subtract V of R2 minus V of R1, which is what? Minus K double, uh, K omega, KQ, capital Q. Uh, minus KQ over R2 minus, again minus, uh, KQ divided by R1. So that would be plus R1, like here, and minus R2. And this is all for our probe object of unit charge. For any other charge, the difference uh, between these should be just multiplied by lowercase q. So W R1 R2 would be equal to V of R2 minus V of R1 times uh, the charge which we are moving. So knowing potential is sufficient 
to basically know everything about the field because you understand what is the work required from mo f to move one uh, uh, object uh, from one distance to another distance depending on its charge of course now how about the force well the force is also very easy remember how we have obtained the potential by integrating the force right times distance well notice this if you have v of r which is equal to minus k q divided by r what if you will differentiate it by r what do you have well the derivative of r is 1 over r square with a minus uh, minus 1 over r square with this minus it would be just plain r square right which is intensity of the field so potential is related to intensity by plane differentiating so knowing potential at every knowing this function v of r potential at any distance r from the center is sufficient to know the work which is performed to move a point from one point to another put to move an object um, it's sufficient to know the uh, amount uh, the force the intensity um, the force actually is intensity times the lowercase q obviously but intensity of the field so you know everything about the field okay position is given uh, intensity is given by this formula uh, potential is given by the potential formula this one so everything is interrelated um, so again um, remember this interesting point about conservative force so electrostatic forces are conservative what else is conservative well gravitation same thing um, what's not conservative well can, uh, consider this what if you would like to move uh, an object inside the water well water resists the movement right now that means that obviously amount of work to move if this is all water to move from here to here is less than from here to over there here so even if gravitation uh, force produce basically a standard um, amount of uh, but not produce it it requires certain amount of work the resistance of the water obviously requires different amount of work so the total work will be different depending on trajectory which you're moving from a point to a point inside this resisting um, uh, substance so there are certain situations when um, the forces are not really conservative but if you consider this to be in the vacuum electrostatic field we are ignoring obviously the very small resistance of the air uh, in this particular case if it's if it's on the earth in an ideal situation in the model which we are talking about a point object in in the in the center of the uh, radial field has certain charge then the field is conservative and the uh, conservation of energy is actually fully in, in, in place in this case. Well, that's all I wanted to talk about uh, today. Uh, probably we will have to solve a few problems and I actually promise you to solve a few problems uh, on potential, on um, intensity of the field and that would be the next lectures. Alright, thank you very much and good luck.